well, otherwise didn't want to. The other one is no good. Okay. Should we begin? I guess so. I'm over here. Oh, yeah, yeah. You got to be on camera, you know, for all, for all the fans. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. So we're, I think we're. We're going to get started. Everybody can hear me. Excellent. Okay. So, uh, thanks for joining uh, another core and FE uh, joint seminar. As a point of reminder, this is the uh, talk two in a series of five talks on modeling and economic evaluation. The first one was given by yours truly. Uh, talks in the new year will be from Tim Evans, Mathieu Mahujeru, and Nisha Almeida. Uh, but for today, I'm, uh, I'm very pleased and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Kevin Schwartzman. He's a full professor and senior scientist at the RIMUHC and member of the McGill International TB Center, respirologist by training and former head of the Division of Respiratory Medicine here, now filling that time uh, after filling that role as the Associate Chair for Research in the Department of Medicine. His research focuses on the evaluation of TB, TB prevention strategies much of it making use of decision analytic techniques, uh, which you'll hear about today, and uh, of which he has a seminal publication in the New England using such methods evaluating the value of improving TB prevention ab abroad. Uh, on a final personal note, uh, Kevin's been a longtime mentor and a key reason I'm actually here at McGill today. Fantastic scientist and colleague, and uh, though I haven't had the privilege of receiving medical care from him, I've heard uh, I've heard stories of people driving cross border with a collapsed lung just so Kevin could be the one to operate. So take that for what you will. And uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Kevin today. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you so much for the very kind introduction. And uh, let me just start by saying I hope you never need my medical services, <laughs> and that no hockey injury would ever occasion such a need. Anyway, thanks. So, yeah, I mean, I, I must say uh, it's a bit humbling to, to be giving this talk because I know there are some very hardcore modelers in the in the uh, in the epi community here and in the epi department. But that being said, I'm, I'm going to basically hopefully tell a bit of a story that in a sense reflects my own journey over many, many years, as you can see from my hair or lack thereof. But also kind of hopefully we'll we'll talk about how um decision analysis has been useful uh, in approaching some clinical and particularly public health decisions, and also how the area itself has, has evolved over the years. So just in terms of disclosures, uh, I currently hold grants from CIHR and the Gates Foundation. I was previously a conseiller scientifique or scientific advisor for the FRQS. I have been paid chair of a DSMB for a, essentially a failed clinical trial of a COVID-19 therapeutic. And as you'll see, I'm a not yet recovering TB modeler. So I'm in like the pre-contemplation phase or whatever of, of my eventual recovery. So I'm hoping that um, with this talk, uh, people attending either in the room, which are few or online, which I guess are a bit more, that people will feel comfortable with some of the key concepts of decision analysis, that you'll be in a position to cite and understand some examples of how it's been used uh, to support uh, clinical and public health decision making, and also that you'll be in a position to recognize some of the major advantages, but also significant limitations of this methodology. Um, so I'm going to start with a clinical decision, and we'll sort of build from there. So the, the clinical decision, and I know I have, well, a couple of clinical colleagues in the room uh, who can relate, hopefully. Uh, so imagine that you, for a moment, that you're the health provider for a 25-year-old first-year medical student. This is real life. This happens very often in this situation. So as her, part of her required battery of tests and evaluations before starting medical school, she went, underwent testing for so-called latent TB infection, and we'll talk about perhaps that a bit later, using uh, an interferon gamma-release assay, which is one of the tests that's available for that purpose. And let's imagine that her test is positive. Um, again, this is not going to be a, a talk that's heavy or going to presuppose a lot of content knowledge. So just that we're speaking the same language, this is a test that's quite specific uh, in, tr in terms of providing immunologic evidence of previous closest infection. And it's important to note that it's not possible to detect such infection uh, 
directly via microbiologic or other forms of testing. So for, again, for so-called latent TB infection or people who have, say, dormant TB bacilli in their bodies, um, we can only detect this through uh, immunologic tests such as this one. So just by way of medical background, and again, this is not meant to be complex, just to, just complete. Imagine that she immigrated to, to Canada from the Philippines 10 years ago and has not traveled outside North America subsequently. No specific exposure history or family history identified with respect to TB. She's completely healthy. Uh, no boxes ticked on the basic questionnaire. And everything else about her is entirely normal. Normal exam, normal x-ray, blood test, everything. Tickety-boo. So... Uh, okay. So she wants your advice as a provider. We'll come back to the public health parts of this in a few minutes. But she recognizes that uh, if indeed the, the test is correct, there's some risk that she could develop TB disease or active TB in the future. She knows uh, from discussion with colleagues and reading that antibiotic preventive treatment could substantially reduce that risk. But she also recognizes that there are well-known risks of treatment, of which likely the most concerning to many people would be drug-induced hepatitis. So the question is, what would you recommend? And on what basis did you make your recommendation? And again, I'm not going to be a hardcore respirologist and force one of my colleagues to answer the question, as my colleagues are used to in rounds. But any suggestions from, from the peanut gallery? All right, I mean, non-respirologists are also welcome to comment, Jonathan, as a, <laughs> someone in the know or Fajri or other people. Right. Right. So, well, what do you think? Yeah, so probably not that high. She's otherwise healthy, no known exposure. Um, but the drug's probably safe at her age. So, okay. um, say and probably treat I'd, or recommend treatment. I'd recommend, but allow them to probably make the decision yeah. because it's, it seems pretty equivocal. Sure. Okay. So obviously this is not a test and nobody's being forced to commit themselves. You didn't, didn't have to sign a prescription. Uh, but the idea is that, I mean, as we all do in clinical practice, right? You could hear Jonathan sort of thinking, okay, well, she's young. She's kind of low risk for, for bad side effects. She's got a lot of years in front of her. There's always this going to be this kind of small but persistent risk of TB disease hanging over her. On balance, probably treat. So, whoops. So, in fact, just to 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 uh, animate some of the points that Jonathan was raising. So, in fact, the widely cited lifetime risk of progression to TB disease, conditional on having the infection. Is about five to ten percent, although this is somewhat controversial. The data, the evidence for that isn't fantastic, and I think more importantly, perhaps a lot of that risk is concentrated in the years immediately after one becomes infected. So, in the little sort of sketch that I've given, a young woman who's been in, in, in Canada for for ten plus has never gone back to a place where she might be exposed to TB or likely would be exposed to TB, as opposed to here it's likely that the, the, the infection is longstanding and so that a good part of that risk has already elapsed, but there's still some remaining. And again, there are data that suggest an annual progression risk of one in 2000 or perhaps less uh, at this point, in, some, in other words, in somebody who's been infected for some time. That being said, of course, we know that the risk increases in the presence of major medical morbidities, such as HIV co-infection and others. And we also know that overall, so all ages, all comers, the case fatality rate for TB disease is about 5%. To be very precise, about 5% of people will die within one year of a diagnosis of TB disease. It's not always clear if they died as a result or with, but be that as it may, that's the estimated case fatality rate. Um, clinical trial data suggests about a 90% 90 efficacy for the rec currently recommended treatment regimens for TB infection. And in fact, I think what Jonathan was sort of alluding to, it's a study that he knows extremely well, is that in a large, a recent large RCT that evaluated what is now the standard regimen for TB infection in Canada, uh, less than 1% of all participants experienced a severe adverse event. And, uh, you know, about one in, one in 300 developed, experienced grade three to five hepatotoxicity with no fatalities. And again, as a consequence of this particular clinical trial led by Dick Menzies, uh, 
That regimen is now the first line recommended preventive treatment regimen in Canada and is one of the first line recommended regimens uh, in many countries of the world accordingly. An earlier study done by Ben Smith, who's the head of CORE, uh, when he was uh, actually an internal medicine resident, uh, suggested that if one had a severe hepatitis uh, during treatment for TB infection or a se severe adverse event enough to re require hospitalization, that about 6% of people who required hospitalization for drug-related adverse events died. So we might assume that with this newer treatment, it would be similar, and perhaps the sample size in that trial was too small to, to detect that. In any case, those are, whoops, there, there we go. So those are, those are some of the, the parameters uh, that I think would inform one's decision-making as a clinician. Um, and what I'm doing here is I'm just showing the same, more or less the same parameters with the decision analysis framework. So you can see a decision tree. So on the left, we're seeing a, a decision to make, either treat for TB infection or don't. This is our student with a positive interferon gamma release assay. And then as we move to the right, we have a series of events that occur by chance, essentially. So we, again, we have a decision that doesn't occur by chance. That's up to us with, 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 the, with, the, with the patient in front of us. But then again, we can decide to treat in which case she might or might not develop treatment toxicity. And I've put in the rates that I just quoted there. Similarly, they might be fatal or not. And then obviously she would not have had the benefit of preventive treatment. So then that, that's where sort of this risk of uh, this future risk of, of, of TB disease comes in, and I've arbitrarily written, you know, 60 more years at age 25, and uh, about uh, one in 2,000 per year. And then what we see here is a 90% reduction with complete treatment based on the clinical trials, and again, about a 5% mortality rate in the, in the presence of TB disease. And what I've kind of bolded here is the idea that, of course, we don't say to some patient in front of us, well, you know, since we know you might not take your treatment, you know we're going to account for 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 uh, for effectiveness as opposed opposed to efficacy. Obviously, when, when it's a clinical decision, we say, well, if you take your treatment, this is what's likely to happen. It's quite different when we talk about groups of people and public health decision making. But in, with a patient in front of us, we, we don't sort of say, well, you know, I'm going to account for the fact that you might be non-adherent with the treatment we're discussing. I mean, usually we say, well, the best case is this will happen, right? So. Uh, and what the what you see on the extreme right is basically the tabulation of outcomes for each sort of path along this way, with sort of semi arbitrarily a one cap, uh, one being used to count the possibility of death and zero for survival. Of course, it could be done the other way around, or we could count uh, we could assign a one to each, TB, each each sort of instance in which the person develops TB. But just for simplicity, I've I've, I've chosen to focus on deaths. So again, obviously not counting deaths from other causes, which are not at which the, the decision we're making it would, would be the same regardless of which path we chose with the patient. So, so again, the details of this slide aren't important, but what I want to convey here is what once we've sketched out a, a decision problem in this manner, we can do what's known as averaging out, rolling back, or folding back. And essentially what that involves is multiplying the, the outcomes at the end, so a one or a zero, essentially by the path probability and then summing them. So what we get at the end of all this, and this is sort of the key message here, is that if we treat for TB infection, her, her uh, risk of dying from, from, well, in this case from TB, because that's the only cause of death we're considering, is like, what is that? That's six in 10,000, I think, roughly. Whereas it's uh, it's higher, it's about uh, one in a yeah. So it's about one in fifteen hundred. Sorry, with treatment here, and about one in six hundred, one in seven hundred without treatment. So although it's either way, death is uncommon. If we account for the possibility of death from treatment for TB infection, on balance, she's still a better off getting treated in terms of death versus survival. And it's a very simplistic calculation. We'll get into all the reasons why it's too simplistic in a moment, but this is just to kind of sketch out the basic decision analysis framework, where again, we pose a, a problem with, with at least two possible decisions we can make. Often there are more, but in this case, there's just two for simplicity. And then a kind of logical stepwise chain of events that follows with that, follows that decision. And at the end, again, in a very simplistic manner, we've covered most of the, the, the sort of major eventualities from this decision. Is that all right?
Now, I'm going to talk for a second about what we mean by one-way sensitivity analysis, and then we'll get into um, many more refinements. But basically, we know that fundamentally the, the balance, and Jonathan touched on that here, is that when we think about there's the risk of death from TB disease, right? And if we give preventive therapy, that risk goes down by 90% versus the upfront risk of death, rare but known to occur with preventive treatment. So one of the questions we could ask ourselves is what would happen if we altered the, or if in truth the case fatality rate for TB disease were lower, and in fact, how low would the case fatality have to be before we would actually change our decision? So we would say actually on balance, it's better not to treat because the risk of dying from TB disease is so low if we hold everything else constant. And this type of analysis is known as a threshold analysis. So, What's done here, and, and this is, we do this all the time when, uh, in, in, in truth, like uh, as you'll see, is instead of when we, when we sketch out a tree, instead of actually assigning fixed probabilities to every node, as has been done for most of these, we actually give it a variable name and then we can play with the, the, the parameter and assign it different values. We can assign it a range over which it be varied. We can do that for every, per, every right now fixed parameter in the tree, we can do this. But right now I'm just showing it for the, the case fatality rate for TB disease. But again, we can do that for all of them. And indeed, this is one of the, I mean, I'm showing in a very sort of cartoonish way, but this is one of the major strengths or advantages of this approach is because, okay, having sketched out what are the events and probabilities that are driving our decision-making can then ask, well, what happens if they start to change and which ones really make a dif difference to our ultimate recommendation or decision and which ones really make very little difference, right? So again, uh, this is a bit busy, but what, what, it, what, what this is intended to show is that at uh, a TB case fatality rate of about 1.8%, so in fact, I'm showing it in the, at the root node, uh, yeah, whoops, there, yeah. So when I've, I've reset the probability, the case fatality rate to the, what, I, what, what the computer solved as the break even point, you can see that the, the, probability of dying is exactly the same whether you treat or don't treat. So this would be the threshold uh, case fatality rate. Again, holding everything else in the model constant. Is that okay? Does that makes sense? Okay. So obviously what that implies is that, again, holding everything else constant, if the case fatality rate is less than 1.8%, she's actually better off not being treated on balance. Okay. So on the other hand, if you knew for a fact that the case fatality rate must be higher than that, then you could say, okay, well, you know, if, if, if maybe you're not sure it's 5%, but you know that it's between 3 and 7%, and you're really confident about that, you could say, well, okay, this recommendation is pretty robust to uh, what is likely very possible variation in the TB case fatality rates. On the other hand, you know, she's a young person. At a young age, her case fatality rate is likely to be much lower, but it'll change over time. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. So, again, just to recap briefly, so what we've done is we've clearly stated the choice to be made here. So treat versus no treat for TB infection following a positive immunologic test. And then in, in logical order, we lay out the relative chance events that will follow that choice, see the probabilities as well as the relevant outcomes. So again, she might, if we choose to treat, she might develop toxicity or not. Conditional on developing such toxicity, she might or may not survive it. Almost always survive, but not always. Uh, TB treatment completion or not, which is a short-term uh, parameter, and then progression over time, which is obviously a long-term thing, uh, and then a multiplier to capture the beneficial effect of, of treatment, with preventive treatment on the risks of progression, and then obviously case fatality rate for TB disease, which is conditional on developing TB disease. So those are some of the main elements of this very simplistic decision tree. Whoops. Okay. In sensitivity analysis, as I've said, we, what we do is we vary one or more of the model parameters, such as probabilities or costs, over pre-specified ranges. And both the point estimates and ranges might reflect best guess estimates, sometimes with arbitrary envelopes within which we vary them. Obviously, that's not ideal. Ideally, we want to base our, our point estimates and ideally uh, ranges and even distributions on uh, values observed in, in the literature. 
uh, confidence intervals from those papers. And of course, the best case is if there's formal meta analysis either available or done yourself with pooled point estimates and confidence intervals generated appropriately. And then what we do essentially is we assess whether the model outputs or findings are robust to that variation. In other words, do they stay the same from a qualitative point of view uh, if we vary this, that, or the other, or multiple parameters at the same time? So in other words, does option A remain preferable to option B? Of course, the exact expected values will change. Exact outputs will change. But from a qualitative point of view, do they remain similar? So traditionally, when I got into this business and computing power wasn't what it is today, really what people focused on was one so-called one-way sensitivity analysis, where they'd go through their variable list and vary one parameter at a time and see what happened, or sometimes combinations or two or occasionally three. But there wasn't the computing power nor necessarily the understanding at that time of sort of more sophisticated approaches to uncertainty. We'll come back to that. Again, threshold analysis is closely related and basically requires you to solve for any given parameter uh, with respect to the break-even or target point with respect to the outcome of interest that you're focusing on. Uh, again, people have often also done scenario analyses where you basically might assign a number of different or alternate input variables because the profile of the situation or the person being modeled or different is different. Uh, so for example, in the exam in the TPT uh, scenario just, uh, just given, we could consider a different reality where the person contemplating treatment is 50, where on the one hand, they would have higher risks of treatment-related toxicity and lower lifetime ahead of them during which they could regress to TB disease, and that could shift the balance between uh, recommending or not recommending preventive treatment. Similarly, we could consider scenarios where the person has other risk factors for progression to TB disease, for example, chronic kidney disease, HIV co-infection, or others. Okay, and again, so those could be kinds of scenario and examples of scenario analysis where we'd say, okay, well, for a person who's aged 50, actually the risk of toxicity is higher. It's now this instead of that. The downstream risk of TB disease is lower because they have fewer years of life left and so on. So those would be examples of scenario analysis. So now we're going to get into more of the, the literature and, and work that others and, and have done or the our team here has done over the years. So in truth, uh, this almost, what I've sketched out almost verbatim was a, a prototypical decision analysis that was done like close to 40 years ago. And I'll show you that in a moment. And it's really a great example of weighing risks and benefits in a quantitative manner. And it, as I've said, it represents really one of the earliest applications of decision analysis to clinical decision making. Decision analysis has been around for longer. It was used in industry and business and so on well before it was applied to healthcare. Um, and in these early, anyway, coming back to the early analyses that were done, in fact, uh, a classic paper, which I'll show you in a sec, really looked at predicted deaths, predicted cases of TB averted, predicted instances of drug-induced uh, drug hepatitis at different ages, and then these were compared. And one of the difficulties actually with some of the early, the very early literature is that they would tabulate, for example, TB disease cases and cases of drug-induced hepatitis that had no metric by which to compare them. So it's difficult to know what to say, okay, well, we're gonna prevent 100 TB cases, but we're gonna cause you know, 300, causes of, uh, 300 cases of, of um, drug-induced hepatitis for whatever number of people that, that we wanna give treatment to. It's very difficult to weigh those one against the other, and we'll come back to how that's actually done. So, Again, this is from JAMA in 1986. And uh, again, I, I, I didn't actually look at this paper before I made my little tree, example tree, but you can see it's actually quite similar conceptually. And it starts with the treatment decision, which in those days related to isoniazid. Uh, and again, it, uh, somebody who was treated could develop hepatitis, but not at all, non-fatal or fatal. They could develop TB and, and, and die or not, and so on and so forth. So it's actually quite similar in a certain sense. And what you see here is, is essentially this is their bottom line results. And what I've highlighted here is their best estimate. So you can see that on balance, uh, for the youngest people, they estimated that, that if they were treated, they would gain, on average, they would gain about 15, 16 days of life. But as, the, as they were older, the gains would be less and less and approaching zero at the, at sort of in, the, in the most elderly people. Uh, and then there were various, like, for example, this was a, a very optimistic scenario analysis with a lot of, you know, 
whoops, reducing the risks and increasing the benefits, sorry, of, uh, of, of, of preventive treatment and the kind of the opposite here, uh, a scenario analysis basically with the odds stacked against chemoprophylaxis, so preventive therapy. But you can see that, that really um, on balance, it's not a huge survival gain per person. Now, a lot of caveats about these in very simplistic kind of models. So first of all, an obvious one is that they don't necessarily account for overestimating TB risk to the extent that the test might be false positive. Now, um, with the interferon gamma release assays, frankly, that's much less of an issue, but all the earlier work related to tuberculin skin tests because back in the day, uh, IGRES didn't exist. So on the one hand, people would account for that sometimes in their models. They'd say, okay, well, you know, positive predictive value in this context is actually this, and we'll, we'll, we'll take that, we'll sort of adjust our, our, our downstream risks accordingly. There were also, in some cases, downstream TB risks available directly from cohort studies that involve people with positive tests, so obviously a mix of people with true and false positives. Um, these early analyses really focused on individual clinical decisions and not necessarily group level or public health policy. Certainly they weren't done with a view to TB elimination, where which many of the current analyses are done, they completely ignore secondary transmission of an infectious disease. And uh, again, I'll come back to this in a few minutes, they don't properly account for morbidity as opposed to mortality. Other caveats, so they don't account for social time preference, what we call discount, more formal sense, uh, meaning that in general, the same event that happens in the future is considered to count less than if it happens today. Uh, these analyses didn't consider cost relative to health effects, so no notion of cost or cost effectiveness, uh, let alone societal costs. Uh, and also really uh, in, the, in 2023, we would say that the way they approached uncertainty was really suboptimal with respect to both inputs and outputs. So for example, they, they provided no uncertainty ranges for their predictions. Yeah. Yeah, I think I just I actually just mentioned that 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 there's no there was no consideration of secondary transmission, which is yeah, exactly. Thank you. So now it the plot thickens essentially when we start to think about groups and populations as opposed to individuals. Because at that point, we have to account for ga caps at the gaps at the various steps of the care cascades. We can't assume that people are going to take their treatment on like the person in front of us, where we just discuss, okay, well, if you take your treatment, this is what we expect to happen. Uh, we also definitely need to account for test characteristics in the group of interest. Again, secondary transmission, as already mentioned, is, actually becomes a major challenge with decision analysis. Um, for example, I'm not sure something got cut off, cut off there, but um, there are, it involves assumptions around independence of the people modeled. Um, so for example, uh, what's often used instead for infectious diseases is dynamic transition models with differential equations or agent-based models, uh, which have their own pros and cons. Another approach that we actually have used in the past was to inflate the expected numbers of persons with TB disease infection to account for downstream transmission, which is a bit crude, but can be done. And then perhaps most usefully, the decision analysis models and software have actually been upgraded to better account for this. And we can actually, there's ways to model, there's programming tricks that can be used to actually better account for ongoing transmission. Uh, along very similar lines, open cohorts have traditionally been very difficult to model. So most of the decision, decision analyses in the past involving healthcare, involving groups have really focused on closed cohorts. But again, there have been improvements in that regard very recently. But that's why in the TB and infectious disease, disease space, we very often see dynamic transmission models to account for secondary transmission and for open cohorts. Uh, obviously, costs and, and cost effectiveness, budget impact are all super important given the resource limitations we're keen, keenly aware of. And the, the two examples I've shown thus far really didn't get into that. From a technical point of view, it's actually very easy to incorporate costs in a model. It just becomes another payoff or outcome. What's much more challenging is getting the costs you need, as Jonathan, Mona, Placide, and other people in the, <laughs> or on the, can attest. That's, that's where it becomes challenging. 
And just a little bit about language, because we're going to see this in some examples in a moment. So when, when, when we do consider both costs and clinical outcomes, if we're comparing two or more strategies, a strategy that is predicted to be less expensive and better health-wise than the, its alternative is said to be dominant. And conversely, the one that costs more but is less effective is said to be dominated. Uh, on the other hand, if one strategy is predicted to be both more expensive and more effective than another, then neither is dominated. And instead, we can estimate the expected cost per health outcome gain. So, whoops. Put formally, the difference in cost divided by the difference in health outcomes between two strategies is known as the incremental cost effectiveness ratio. So, for example, in many papers, you'll see constructs like the incremental cost per life year gained, per TB case averted, per DALI disability, uh, uh, disability associated life year, and so on. You'll, you'll see the uh, disability adjusted life year, rather, you'll see that, uh, you'll see those kinds of constructs. So, what about future events and costs? And I've touched on this briefly. So from a programming point of view, I'm not going to belabor this, it's possible to capture this more efficiently by using what we call Markov processes, which are essentially recurring probabilities of, of moving from one state to another over, over, some period, over each year or each cycle of a simulation. And this is just, again, the, the details aren't important, but this is just showing a sort of classic way of capturing this where somebody with latent TB infection can remain infected in, or in a given year they have a cycle for any period of time they can reactivate or they can remain, just remain infected or they can die. If they uh, survive their TB, they can then move to having had TB before or of course they can, they can, they can be dead. Um, and one of the things we can do with a process like this is even though the basic structure stays the same, we can change the probability of transitioning from one state to a, to a different one. They can change over time. So again, for example, we could set that Immediately after somebody acquires TB infection, their progression rate is fairly high and then becomes lower over time. So that can easily be done with this type of this type this type of motif or element in, in a decision tree. It's also uh, again from this will come up. I think you may have touched on this when you gave your talk, Jonathan. But discounting is also an important element of the work we do when we're project predicting future events. And again, this refers to the notion that above and beyond inflation. The further into the future an event or a cost accrues, the less value it has relevant, relative to the same event or cost if it took place today. So, uh, and, and this, this uh, essentially decreases in exponential fashion. Uh, the specific formula is here. Again, the details aren't important for the purposes of this talk. Uh, it's often recommended to use a 3% dis annual discount rate, although this varies by country. And in, for Canada, actually, the sort of Health Technology Assessment Authorities have suggested a 1.5% discount rate. But just to highlight this, using a 3% discount rate, $100 spent 10 years from now is equivalent to spending $74 today. And in fact, to be sort of consistent uh, or lo logically consistent, in fact, strictly speaking, it's also required, once you discount costs, it's also required to discount health events although that can seem counterintuitive. And so for simplicity, we often show undiscounted health events as well, because it can be confusing to people to, to, or to, difficult to make sense of sometimes of discounted uh, clinical events. This was an early analysis that was done uh, by me with Dick Menzies now many years ago, uh, looking at uh, immigrant screening for TB. And this is going to be a recurrent theme, as you'll see. And uh, just what I'm showing here is just snippets of the decision trees just for, for interest. Again, it's not to, to concentrate on them on, in detail, but simply to say, for example, somebody could enter the, the simulation with either active TB disease at the time of entry to Canada. They might have so-called inactive infection, or they might be completely uninfected. Okay, And different things could happen to them accordingly. And again, this is the same motif, the market markup process for somebody with latent TB infection. In this particular analysis, we did include secondary generation of TB infection with respect to testing and treatment costs. And we also, in a sensitivity analysis, considered secondary generation of TB disease. And then, again, the details of that are in the paper, although it's, it's very old and somewhat antiquated. But what did we find? Uh, I mean, it was, it was still, I think, a useful analysis, even though it's, again, it's quite old. But it basically told us that relative to what is what is, it remains done to this day, which is to screen immigrants to Canada with chest x-rays, uh, 
primarily with the goal of detecting prevalent TB disease, but also latent TB infection at high risk of progression, that broadening that to skin test everybody would be much less cost effective. And so really we, we considered sort of three prototypical groups with respect to prevalence of TB infection and HIV seropositivity. And all, as you would expect, the lower the prevalence of TB infection and of HIV seropositivity, the more expensive and less cost effective all screening becomes. But, it, but relatively consistently, or certainly with the groups we would be most interested in with respect to TB risk, uh, it was much more expensive to do tuberculin skin test screening, although at very low risk of, of, of TB infection, things kind of reversed. And one of the other things we found, I think, was a useful message and you know not surprising one, but remains to this day, was that a very significant uh, contributor to cost effectiveness is adherence to preventive treatment. In other words, if we're going to screen people, it's with a, a view to offering preventive treatment for those with TB infection, at least those at, at high risk of progression of TB disease. And if either prescription rates by, by providers and or completion by patients is low, this really completely compromises the cost effectiveness and population impact of, of any such screening program. Again, it's not surprising at all, makes it logical, but this showed it in more sort of quantitative terms. And so you can see a, a basically you know, a huge difference between uh, the impact and cost effectiveness with very high pr prescription rather in adherence and the opposite at the low end. Um, so Jonathan touched on this, and again, I'm not going to. Uh, no, no paper will be discussed in detail, but this was uh, one again, really thanks in large part to Dick, but working with some other people who are known to some people here. Ben Smith will recognize Graham Barr there. <laughs> There's other other people that uh, Olivia Oxlade is well known to some of you, um, but just to say that uh, essentially this was an analysis that suggested that by investing in TB care and prevention in, in, in countries that, uh, from which migrants are likely to come, we would actually do better in terms of preventing TB here and also be more cost effective than basically intensifying screening for people once they arrive here. Uh, in this particular analysis, the primary case study involved migrants from Mexico to the US. We also considered uh, people coming from Haiti or the Dominican Republic. Uh, again, this is now almost 20 years old. And so there are very significant limitations to this work. Uh, for example, I think it's fair to say now with the benefit of hindsight that the magnitude and, and timing of the downstream impact of improving TB care abroad was really uh, quite substantially overestimated. Certainly was, you know, was estimated to take place almost immediately. Uh, and again, the, probably the magnitude was also overestimated. There also wasn't formal calibration of this model. We didn't consider secondary transmission. We didn't properly consider treatment toxicity. And again, at that point, it was quite difficult to do uh, what we consider now consider modern uh, modern approach to uncertainty analysis. But all those caveats being said, I think what was useful here, I hope was useful, was that at least help reframe some of the discussion away from just constantly intensifying screening uh, approach, you know, more and more rigorous screening of migrants with less and less yield versus really thinking about where the TB burden really falls in the world and, and what really should be done to address it better. Um, so a little bit about morbidity. So what is most useful in this type of analysis, of course, is to be able to capture morbidity in common units, for example, for both TB disease and side effects of treatment, and particularly side effects of preventive treatment. So this is where the use of utility or disability weights comes in. Uh, and this can generate estimates of quality-adjusted survival or disability-adjusted survival. And again, using the decision analysis framework, those can be programmed as payoffs or outcomes. They can be attributed to relevant events like developing TB disease, developing treatment toxicity, et cetera. And then obviously the same kind of calculations I sketched out at the beginning can be done in exactly the same way for, for qualities or dallies. And I think what's particularly useful about that is it allows on the one hand to express TB related events in this case in a common language, but even more importantly, once we're talking about qualities and dallies, for public health folks and analysts to be able to think about, well, how does this look compared to other health programs we do or don't invest in? In other words, what's the, what's the, what's, how much, how much quality adjusted survival, how much uh, disability adjusted survival do we improve 
relative to whatever money we might want to spend on a program as opposed to, I don't know, uh, an HPV vaccine or uh, smoking cessation or whatever it is, right? All of a sudden, we can then ex express out health outcomes in a much more um, uh, polyvalent metric. So in fact, we went through this for, for TB. Again, the details aren't important. This was Melissa Bauer's PhD thesis, uh, I guess about nine or 10 years ago now. And uh, essentially she, with, with uh, our team, went out and interviewed uh, people with TB disease, people treated for latent TB infection, and others who had been evaluated but not treated for latent TB infection, so people of similar dem demographics as a comparison group. And essentially what Melissa showed, whoops, was that um, early on in the course of TB disease, there's a clear decrement in health-related quality of life and health utility, whether you use uh, using two different instruments in this case with very similar results. But then after a couple of months, it, it kind of come back to after a month or two of treatment, they really regain their health as reported in this manner. And interestingly, also on average, there's very little decrement in the treatment of latent TB infection, even though we all know it can have side effects. But at a kind of group level, these are largely washed out by, by um, essentially, uh, there's a random variation between people as opposed to system systemic variation due to, due to the, the drugs or, its, or uh, to the treatment uh, adverse events. Whereas for TB disease, there's a clear signal that quality of life utility is worse. So we've been able to adjust some of our, our own estimates for that. And what about transmission? Uh, I mentioned that's a major limitation. So uh, more than 10 years ago, actually, with Olivia Oxlade and with Dick, uh, we were able to come up with a kind of workaround where, uh, again, the details aren't important, but we could essentially use the model to inform the next cycle. So each cycle, if we knew how many, how many new infections were generated out of what population, we could then use that to inform the annual risk of infection for the next cycle and so on and so forth. And in fact, since that time, the TRIAGE, which is the decision analysis software that we and many others use, actually explicitly allows us to model open or dynamic cohorts and individuals moving back and forth between different health states, so including acquiring infection and so on. So in fact, it, it, the whole sort of, from a technical standpoint, it's also much more refined than it was. And then, when, and then we can also use, again, more appropriate simulation techniques to populate cohorts according to distributions, uh, you know, what proportion of people come from this or that country, for example, and this can also change over time. So this is taken from uh, Olivia's uh, paper, which was part of her PhD thesis in EPI at that time. And as I've just said, it's a way of sort of iteratively adding a risk of infection and then uh, each year uh, based on, on what on, on information we have. And then again, cycling back to know how many secondary cases of TB disease occur and so on and so forth. Other improvements. So again, with, with a huge improvement in computing capacity, what we're now able to do is uh, probabilistic sensitive analysis, so full-on variation of all model parameters at the same time according to preset distributions, multiple, multiple model runs, so really a full-on Monte Carlo analysis, which allows us to generate uncertainty ranges for single outcomes, and also generate cost-effectiveness, probabilistic cost-effectiveness claims, which I'll show in a moment, where we can really vary and where we can consider cost and health outcomes simultaneously. The, uh, our models can now handle many, many different payoffs, not just not that just death or survival or TB cases, but all kinds of things. And it's also possible to use counters to keep track of and label people who pass through various health states. So the whole sort of, from a technical programming point of view, the, the software has really uh, expanded substantially. Um, so just a, a few last last papers that I'll, I'll cite as examples, and there'll be time for a few some time for questions. So this was work done by, again, by Proceed, by Benjamin is here, uh, by co uh, Olivia, colleagues in Brazil. Uh, and um, again, the details aren't important, but we were, this particular analysis looked at kind of, we'll say best case scenarios for the potential health impacts of digital, so-called digital adherence technologies to help people through TB treatment, uh, treatment primarily for TB disease, but also to some extent for latent TB infection. And although uh, there were some fairly rosy, in some cases, projections, we also emphasized that really our projections were limited by the scarcity of published estimates of clinical benefit or effect. 
And in fact, it's not even so much the substantive results of the analysis, but the knowledge gaps that it highlighted, I think justified actually being able to do much more work to, to actually search out what, what, is the, what are the clinical impacts, what is known about the clinical impacts of this, these technologies. So in fact, Mona, who's sitting quietly in the back row, has spearheaded a bunch of systematic reviews in that regard. Um, this was an analysis looking at uh, computer-assisted detection of possible TB-related abnormality. So essentially AI-based software that uh, allows for automated uh, chest X-ray interpretation in settings where there aren't radiologists uh, readily available. And again, the, the details aren't super important, but the bottom line conclusions were that implementation of this technology uh, could basically avert a certain number of mi unnecessary microbiologic tests and people at low risk to have TB disease and uh, therefore would lower costs, but also uh, eliminate some uh, essentially uh, false positive or inappropriate treatment. And again, just the details aren't important, but just to show this is this is the decision tree we showed in our in the paper. Um, and it's very familiar. Again, it, it follows the exact same kind of principles we've discussed with a, uh, with a clinical decision or you know, pol health policy decision at the beginning. Uh, people to whom it's applied may or may not have TB disease, and then various steps in the, in the, in the referral and diagnosis cascade, again, with and without uh, radiographic triage. And as, as promised, this is a, a, an example of uh, 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 cost effectiveness planes. Uh, so this is generated uh, with 10,000 model runs. So this is a true Monte Carlo type analysis. And what you see here is that uh, in most cases, uh, the uh, addition of this technology was either full on uh, cost saving as shown here, or at least cost effective according to uh, the so-called willingness to pay threshold. In other words, the uh, cost per DALI averted was, was within what we might call an acceptable range with a small number of simulations falling outside that. Again, the details aren't important, but just to show what this analysis actually looks like when you, when you report it. Kevin, uh, this... can, you, um, can you just, we can't see on Zoom the pointer. So do you mind just going back through that and just saying the colors of what you were just mentioning? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so in, in uh, I'm sorry about the pointer. I didn't realize that. So in blue, we see the sort of the the quadrant of the of the cost effectiveness planes, where in this case the AI based chest X ray interpretation was both more expensive and more effective than uh, the existing standard of care. With the red line, the diagonal red line showing the, the so called willingness to pay threshold. The green dots show simulations where in fact the um, the new technology was both more effective and cost saving. The red shows simulations where it was more uh, more expensive and, and less effective, so bad. And the yellow is sort of uh, the parallel of the blue in the sense that it shows situations where the uh, simulations where the technology was cheaper, but also led to poorer health outcomes. But the key point of the graph is that the vast majority of the 10,000 model runs falls either uh, in the cost effectiveness part, uh, cost effective part, sort of below the red line, or frankly, cost saving. Does that help? Yes, thanks. No worries. Okay. Um, uh, this was uh, looking at tobacco reduction strategies for TB prevention in Inuit communities. Uh, showing uh, a relatively modest reduction in in uh, in, in uh, TB morbidity um, and TB deaths with a fairly intensive approach to tobacco reduction, uh, with increased taxation being the only cost saving strategy. Uh, and what I wanted to show here was a, a, an example of extensive univariate sensitivity analysis with what we call tornado diagrams, where again here. Each parameter's model is, is varied alone, with others kept constant. But you can see which ones have a, a higher versus lower impact on the ultimate results. So for example, the probability of making a TB diagnosis among people who truly have TB, is quite, uh, that, that has relatively little bearing on the results. Whereas the progression risk, meaning how rapidly people progress from TB infections to TB disease, 
has a, has is is has major bearing on the results as you would expect. Um, I think this may be the the last one. Um, so this was an analysis done to look at uh, so-called active, well, essentially active case finding, but also expanded screening for TB latent TB infection in high incidence Inuit communities. Again, this this particular work was done with Faz Khan. Uh, it was Ashna Upal, who was a mass MSc PhD student with me in Placide, uh, but also colleagues from from uh, from Nunavik, and essentially. This analysis incorporated local data from two villages which had experienced significant outbreaks. Uh, we used an open cohort model, and this is a schematic of it here. And as mentioned, the software we use is now able to accommodate that. And essentially what it suggested was that in the, in the face of repeated outbreaks, which is what was being seen in these communities, that in fact, uh, screening the, the entire community every two years for, for TB disease, as well as TB infection, uh, essentially detecting new uh, people newly infected with, T, with uh, TB infection was actually quite cost effective and um, uh, was certainly better, uh, was, was actually cheaper and more effective than the status quo of no screening and quite cost effective com compared to just one off, one round of village wide screening. Uh, and again, an important point here was that this particular analysis was requested and informed by the local health authorities as well as by community representatives. So in fact, we I think well, it was used to help guide future practice in that um, there have been repeated community-wide screens uh, in some of the communities with, that have had outbreaks. And it's important to stress that many communities have not had outbreaks. And uh, this has not been is not germane to them, but for a couple of communities, it has been quite relevant. So what's next? Uh, some updated analyses related to migrant screening. We've managed uh, through a lot of trials and tribulations to develop a very large open cohort model that simulates foreign-born Canadian residents through 2050 based on the sort of announced immigration patterns to Canada from the federal government. And this is being used to evaluate impacts and costs of different screening and treatment strategies, again, targeting TB infection. Uh, there's a closed cohort model with Chris Greenaway, Anna Fournier, who's a postdoc, and, and, and other team members to look at the impact and costs of, of sort of more, more essentially more support uh, in terms of um, culturally, culturally appropriate care, interpreters, and so on, in terms of improving the care cascade for TB infection for viral hepatitis. Uh, Benjamin, who's here, here is uh, spent many hours, blood, sweat, and tears, and other well, any anyway, other hardships, uh, looking at the impact and cost of TB infection screening according to different thresholds uh, for TB progression risk related to comorbidities, but also considering different time points after arrival in Canada. And this, interestingly, is anchored in true life data from B Health at BC Health Admin databases. So we actually know what the, the true risks of downstream TB are according to what country people came from, what other medical risk factors they have, and so forth. And then we're actually trying, hoping to revisit uh, this question of investment overseas to improve uh, TB morbidity and mortality here. And that, so we're going to redo that analysis in a more refined way, sort of using 2023-24 standards as opposed to early 2000s. This is a teaser from uh, uh, Aria and Placide's work uh, showing actually model calibration against observed TB cases in the first part of the this century, showing fairly good model fit actually. And, and this is a, a, an example of the type of output that can be generated where we actually have expected cases of TB disease according to region of origin. Um, but again, still being refined, but just to, as a teaser, the kind of stuff we're working on. So just some key messages as, to close. I think decision analysis can provide a useful framework for informing various clinical and public health decisions which we have to always have to make under conditions of uncertainty. We never have perfect knowledge. It does allow us to integrate evidence from multiple sources, for example, clinical trials, old natural history data, and so forth, to make certain kinds of predictions about the consequences of our decisions, either individual or group level, in the healthcare context. I think it's pretty clear that it forces us to be explicit about the steps and parameters we use uh, or that are involved in, in deciding between competing choices or strategies. 
And among those, it can help identify which parameters and assumptions are really the main drivers of those choices, which ones are less important. In other words, it points us toward those where we really need more rigor, perhaps formal data synthesis, or perhaps actually going out and acquiring brand new data. Uh, and it also helps us assess how robust our choices are within the limits of the data we do have available to us. Clearly, and I think it's a really important point, this type of analysis can sometimes help inform our choices, but clearly can never be the only basis for them. Uh, something I haven't really dwelled on, but it perhaps is implicit in some of the earlier discussion, that the framework of this approach is explicitly utilitarian, so everybody counts equally, uh, greatest good for the greatest number, and so on. Uh, we didn't get into risk aversion and things like that, which are, is also important. But I think it's it's worth saying that, as shown, this framework doesn't necessarily incorporate other key values or concerns, notably those around equity, although there have been attempts to refine some of this uh, framework to do that. Um, I'd say that although the software and understand and its an understanding of, of decision analysis have advanced in the healthcare sector, we still face some challenges with dynamic and stochastic processes, and we, li we live these at every lab meeting, especially the stochastic piece. Um, the work is always, always much long, takes much longer, and it's always more complicated than init we initially think, even when we make a certain number of simplifying assumptions. And in fact, I would say it used to be that a major advantage of this approach was exactly that, that it was relatively simple and transparent. I mean, I think most of us can sort of relate to the kind of simple decision trees I was showing earlier. There have been a lot of technical advances, I've, as I've mentioned, which actually make for much more rigorous analysis, but it can be more difficult to follow at the same time. So some of that simplicity, I think, gets lost. And it's a challenge actually for us as both as modelers, but also as, as knowledge transmitters, people who write papers and try and help form guidelines and stuff, to distill it into messages that are clear and easy to understand, but yet grounded in, in rigorous analysis. So as, within, as with all modeling, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Um, and so perhaps another more positive way to say that is that any analysis can only be as good as the information that underlies or supports it. With that, I'll thank you for your attention. And a uh, question. There's one question in the chat from uh, Dr. Ezer. How do you model for migrants when their country's TB programs fail uh, with political unrest? Is there some uh, known delay on how that will impact prevalence rates? Presumably won't change right away. That's actually, that's a really good question, Nicole. Um, there is some information about that, actually. Um, so um, I can't remember who, I guess, well, actually, it was partly Olivia's work uh, back in the day. So she actually looked at um, the impact of the wars um, on, uh, on, on uh, TB morbidity and mortality. So uh, the World War I and World War II. And in fact, it's the same reference that I showed earlier in medical decision making, um, where uh, it's it's I mean it's been known and recognized, but she actually was able to capture it modeling wise that with the breakdown in uh, essentially social conditions, there were there was worsening uh, TB epidemiology. So that 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 can be incorporated. I think the second part of your question is like what's what's the lag? I mean, obviously, in the extreme situation of a of a world war. It's almost immediate, but we have the unfortunate natural experiment of COVID that also uh, has has shown uh, some information about what happens when when health programs break down or aren't able to meet meet the needs with respect to TB. And um, the last answer to your question is that actually in some of the upcoming modeling work, uh, on the one hand, we hope to look at you know in a positive way what happens when when uh, uh, TB conditions improve overseas, how that looks like, what that looks like in migrants from those countries when they come to Canada, but it's quite easy to look at the flip side and say, well, what happens if things go south, uh, pardon the expression, uh, with respect to TB prevention and care in a given country, how will that translate into, into, um, into how things look, in, look with migrants? I would say that right now, it looks like there's a significant lag. Uh, what I mean by that is like some of the initial modeling we've done around that looks like there's a significant lag, uh, but we'll be able to better quantify that soon. And, and that you, Jonathan, also has a, uh, a grad student who's looking at some of that. Yeah, okay. sure. Uh, Hiroshi says, uh, thanks very much for the talk. In your four color plot with cross classification of cost and treatment effectiveness for simulation, yeah. are we able to tell which patient 
uh, tend to fall into which color group based on their social and demographic characteristics? Okay. Um, so in this, I mean, the way this particular analysis was done, no, but, it, but conceptually, yes. So for example, um, again, be, because we can now use sort of trackers or we can use other, well, that would be more of a tracker. We we can actually we can generate, for example, an Excel spreadsheet for each person, quote unquote, simulated in the model, and we can ask. Well, by the way, was that per, well, you know, for example, what country was that person come from that was simulated, or what other uh, ever whatever other attribute of that person is in the model? So indeed, uh, I think what you're driving at, Hiroshi, is it, it is possible, for example, to run regressions to see what characteristics of people or populations might be associated with certain kinds of outcomes. So yes, it is, and conceptually it is possible to do that. It wasn't done here, but for example, people use um, uh, partial correlation coefficients to get at that. So yes, it is possible. How do, how do we factor in multi-resistant TB and anticipated anti-bioresistance? This is from David Alexandre Gallian. Great, thanks. Also a great question. So, um, Yes, the, the short answer is we can and do, uh, depending on the specific question at hand. So um, for um, uh, migrants to Canada, for example, we know what uh, well, we, we know what we know what proportion of TB disease in Canada is is multidrug resistant, and in in which population groups in general it occurs. So that that is and can be built in. Um, there may be other other situations, for example. Um, we did well with colleagues. We did modeling work uh, related to other countries where uh, drug resistance is much more common. And again, that gets built in in terms of poorer outcomes, more expensive care, and sometimes ongoing transmission of of, of drug resistant strains. So yes, that 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 is and can be counted. Hopefully, that answers the question. One last quick question from Zoom. Yeah. Uh, from Luz Villa, uh, the screening done in Nunavut was it made using Ultra? Ultra plus CXR or AI CXR and Y2 means? Okay. Um, so it was it was not done using AI CXR. It was done using uh, basically reg regular digital x-rays, but not uh, not with uh, not with AI. So it was chest x-ray with uh, radiologist interpretation. Um, well, sometimes a local doctor would, would obviously look at the x-ray first, but uh, ultimately, radiologist interpretation, and the gene expert. I don't think it was the gene expert ultra. I think it was the the, the previous gene expert to answer that question. Um, I don't believe it was the gene expert ultra. Oh, um, so we so why two years? We so we actually looked. So for simplicity, we just showed the the results for two years. So we looked at one year, and it was much more, much more costly with limited limited additional gain. And, and whereas three years was 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 worse, so we two years was kind of the best balance. Yeah. Ben. Oh, Nandini, sorry. Yeah, just a minor question. I want to follow up with what uh, Hiroshi just said. Uh, I mean, if I understood his question correctly, he's asking if these ICER values can be tied back to individual characteristics. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I'm uh, because after all, isn't the ICER something that's calculated at the population level? So again, this is this is not showing. Sorry, I I should have been clear. This is not showing. These are not ICERs, right? This each of these is a point. It's 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 basically showing for that run of the model, okay, which could be an individual person, uh, or in some depending on how you set up your analysis, or it could be ten thousand runs of a pop. Right. Sorry, it depends on how you set up your analysis, what your question is. But for example, if, if, you're, if, you're, if your question and analysis are such that each of these dots represent the individual, right? You also you can also retrieve information about from each model run so for each individual that runs through. You can also query or you can tabulate essentially. Okay, this was a person of this age with this or that other characteristic, right? And then you could ultimately again. If, you, if your analysis is focusing, if you're reporting individuals and not simulations for an entire population, right, then you could say, okay, well, you know, of the individuals that fell into this quadrant, meaning cost saving, 
and more effective, they tended to have this profile. Their, their average age was this. And whereas the people where it was, let's say, um, you know, terrible, where it was more expensive, but, but less effective, they tended to have that profile. And so you could do that. Yeah. And so tying back to the first question, you began the talk with of that woman, young yeah. woman who had a positive test. Yeah. And I was struck by what Jonathan said, we leave the decision to her. Will she have the benefit of a cost effectiveness analysis to make a good yeah. decision? Right. Well, I mean, so so in fact, there are, I mean, there are, you probably know this from your, your from the work you do, but there are decision aids that are that are developed for for different um for different, you know, dilemmas, shall we say, in in in, in healthcare. Um in fact, I know uh, our colleague Jay Johnston wants to develop one for exactly this kind of situation to basically make more more patient friendly or client friendly a lot of like these same considerations, but to spell it out in terms that are easier uh, for patients to interact with. So, so, and then again, informally, we tend to do that in ourselves in the, in the clinical situation, right? I mean, and it's not, of course, not, not only in TB in any, you know, for example, when we suggest to somebody, they take antihypertensive medications, right? We're sort of saying, well, you know, yeah, these medications, you're not, you may not feel any different day to day. Yeah. Your blood pressure readings will be better, but you probably won't notice much difference. You might have these side effects as how often these occur, but at the same time, we're, I'm suggesting this because I think this is going to cut your, or I know based on evidence that on average for people like you, this is going to cut your, your stroke risk by X percent and your heart attack risk by Y percent. So we already, you know, try at least to engage patients in that, that level of discussion. You're quite right that we don't necessarily usually put up decision trees for them. But again, it, it's a lot of what we, what we goes in the decision trees is discussed in a different way, you know, it may not be integrated in quite the same way. But the other thing is it also gives people the opportunity to, to, to apply their own values, right? Because again, some, some people, you know, and what I've shown, if we go back to the very beginning, what I showed was very, like, very simplistic, completely like no notion of risk aversion, you know, everything is sort of of equal value, meaning that, you know, you know, that a, a death from TB, even 10 years from now was valued the same way as, as a death from preventive treatment now. Now that's a pro that's a discounting problem, but also there's some people who say, listen, I'd much rather take my chances on something that I, that might or might not ever happen in the future than taking a medication now that I know has maybe not major, but non-zero risk. And I, and I know by taking that medication, I'm exposing myself to that risk. Whereas, you know, 90, 95% of the time, I'll never even have TB disease, let alone the risk of dying from it, right? And that, I mean, that, that's a, a viewpoint one can understand. And it might not be, you know, they might not be rationalizing their expected value, but it's also a completely reasonable way to approach the problem, right? Thank you. Ben, I think you had a question. Thanks, great talk. So this is a very meta level question. I personally see the importance and value of these types of modeling and outputs and papers. I'm curious in your experience, how potent is this type of research toward the decision makers? Like yeah. if you see like best case scenario, cost savings, no doubt every, you know, do they actually change the policy? Like take your New England Journal paper, like did they change policy? And if they didn't, why not? Right. Politics? It's a great question. So um, a couple of points. So I, 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 it's, it, it's a mixed reviews, bottom line. So, in I mean, I, I'm going to talk about the TB space because obviously that's what I know best. So I think that the modeling, actually not necessarily by us, in fact, primarily not by us, has 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 actually informed quite a bit. Um, to some extent, like sort of clinical policy, but especially around um, things like like even higher level, like public health, real like public health policy, and also even R and D, or at least expressed goals for R&D because um, what's done, for example, so in terms of your high level public health policy, there's been, you know, Jonathan's been involved actually just showing work today uh, to our, to our teams, you know, where there's, there's pretty well reasonably robust evidence from, from, from modeling work that for example, we should really be fo expand thinking seriously about expanding the use of TB preventive therapy in populations or settings where it's not necessarily widely done. Because, you know, that sort of old doctrine was, you know, 
forget about TB, latent TB infection. We have to deal with TB disease, and you know, and then then we can worry about about uh, dealing with TB infection. And of course, if you have uncontrolled TB disease and transmission thereof, of course, you have to deal with that. But it was thought that well, you know, treatment or screening and treatment or finding people with TB infection was too expensive, could only be done in high income countries, blah, blah, blah. But it turns out that's almost certainly not the case. And WHO, for example, has substantially changed its approach based on based on that that kind of information. So I think that's that's like the those are the positive reviews. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, negatives, yeah, I mean, like for example, the, the stuff that we published you know, back in the day about we you know said about about investment in TB prevention and care overseas. I mean, people pay lip service to that. I mean, I think to be fair, there has been quite a lot of well, relative to what existed before that, there has been quite a lot of investment in, uh, you know, like for example, USAID is very heavily invested. CDC is very heavily invested. Obviously, the Gates Foundation, um, Global Fund, etc. There is there's, it's also become clear that that's a fraction of what's needed, but nonetheless. Like it's true that there's much more attention in a certain sense to TB prevention and care overseas from like the locals here. Obviously, <laughs> it's an enormous problem for people in South Africa, Indonesia, Kenya, whatever, whatever. But I mean, like, I mean, obviously they're like, well, you know, WTF? Like, this has always been a problem for us. Why, are you, why are you just interested now? Kind of thing <laughs> you know, for for the people here and you know, and the global funders. But at least there's that. And again, where modeling has also been helpful, actually, as I said, when I gave the example of R&D, so it's really intensely used to justify investment in, TB, in, in new TB vaccines. So I, so you guys, may, you may not be aware of this. I, I only really learned this or learned the, the sort of some of the details of this at the, the, the last the, the union meeting uh, just, a, just a couple of weeks ago. But Gates essentially is investing $550 million in a phase three a clinical trial of a new of a, well, a new TB vaccine. I mean, obviously, it, there's been already preliminary information about it, or it wouldn't have gotten to this stage. But just to say, like the mod, the sort of modeling of the epidemiologic impact of that. It's a vaccine that that is it's intended to be given. It's not it's not um it's not like BCG, and it's not given to, to infants to prevent uh, primary infection. It's given to prevent progression from infection to disease. And because that's actually where the like modeling shows that that's where the bang for the buck is in terms of getting rapid uh, uh, sort of rapid uh, reductions in TB disease and also halting transmission. Because I mean, and again, the pediatric people don't like this, but the fact of the matter is that that kids who get TB generally don't transmit, because uh, and 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 adults do. So the so the sort of the from the public health point of view, the money, the the, the gain, the huge epidemiologic gain, and and sort of downstream health benefit is in preventing transmissible TB in adolescents and, and, and young adults. And so that's where the vaccine is being trialed. Again, ba again, not just out of thin air, but based on obviously earlier earlier work that's promising. But just to say, like, I think the modeling has been quite helpful in, in driving that agenda um, and essentially getting uh, essentially funders like Gates to take on the risk that, that essentially pharmaceuticals won't take. So, so I don't know if, does that help answer your question? Other questions from, uh, okay. Uh, could I ask final question? Oh, oh yeah. If there is time. Um, in the summary, you mentioned most analytic approaches utilitarian, and there is less um, e equitable component. But by looking at this chart you are displaying now, as well as some modeling approach, it, uh, isn't it like if I'm getting meaning of equity uh, right? Isn't it possible to generate some cost benefits for each? Patient strata or patient group, which I kind yeah. of think it's, it's, it is. It's so, so yeah, thanks, Hiroshi. Yeah, it is possible. It's it's it it's a bit more complex, but it is possible in that it, there are people starting to do this. So it's not that it doesn't exist at all, and or and it's not that it's impossible. It's that it it's something that traditionally hasn't been done very much. But yes, it can be, uh, for sure. I mean, obviously in the TB space, a lot of the work that's being done, of course, deals with uh, more vulnerable populations in any event, but you're quite right that that it is possible 
you know, when, when you start to disaggregate uh, as opposed to just taking group means and that kind of thing, it is possible and, and group expected values, it is possible to, to look more at equity issues. So you are quite right. It is, it is possible. Just something that again, hasn't been done as much up until now. Great, thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Okay. Um, thanks, Kevin, again, for a great and engaging talk. And we went 15 minutes of questions, which was excellent. Uh, the next uh, talk in this series, I believe, is the second week of January. And uh, that'll be by Tim Evans talking about health system financing. So look out for that. Third week of January. There we go. I've been corrected. Okay. So third week. Nope. Yeah. Oh. Oh, the uh, uh, there we are. The the cast of characters, or much of the cast of characters, really. Uh, I should have been got distracted and and didn't show this. Or, but Placide, who's not here, but is a pillar. Jonathan, likewise, who's obviously a faculty member now and incredibly bright, committed, perceptive contributor. Aria, uh, Anna, Benjamin is here. Mona, who's here. Uh, Olivia, who did a lot of work earlier on. Ashna. Dianaba, uh, these are all, uh, Ashna was a master's, Dianaba postdoc, Melissa PhD, Dick who was my first mentor, again, other faculty colleagues. And then I put in the corner, David Paltiel, who taught me my first issues, decision analysis course when I was doing my master's in public health, not at Yale, let's just be very clear on that. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so it's kind of all his fault. Anyway, so thanks to the team and thank you again.